I can hear you very well. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll get started. Um, as I said a moment ago, uh, this is Spike Bighorn. I'm the project manager for the Sovereignty in Indian Education uh, program with the Bureau of Indian Education, and I'm very happy to join this afternoon. And Ina is going to join us and provide her perspective on a BIE grant that was provided to her organization to um, to do some work with native language programs throughout the, the country. Um, I'm fairly new to this process. Very happy to be here. Um, some of you might have worked with my predecessor, Dr. Maureen Lesky. Uh, she left the Bureau of, excuse me, she didn't leave the Bureau of Indian Education. She left the, uh, the Sovereignty and Indian Education program to go to another area in BIE and we're happy she's still with us. And I stepped in about six months ago and have been playing catch up uh, ever since. So um, I will turn it over to Ine and uh, you can go ahead and uh, pr pr proceed. Thank you for, for joining us. Thank you, Spike. Really, thank you for being our host. And um, can you please uh, mute everybody? So um, first of all, again, thanks, Spike. And uh, we've never met, but we've been back and forth by email. And now I was hoping to see your face, but I don't see your video. <laughs> so anyway, um, and thank you. Greetings from Santa Fe, New Mexico. This is where I'm uh, zooming in from and it is the home for the uh, Indigenous Language Institute. And uh, we really, really sincerely send prayers to all of you, all of us who have experienced the challenges of this pandemic. It's affecting all of us. Ah, <laughs> and then um, <laughs> there's Spike, we can see him now. Um, and we really wish for continued safety for all of you and your loved ones. And I'm very honored to be asked to be on this um, meeting, this summit, which I've attended two years ago in person. And uh, I'm happy to be back. And I wanted to um, first share screen is what I do here, I think. Right. So while they're helping me out with the technology, I will start. And um, basically um, we did receive, we were one of the five recipients of this BIE grant. <clears throat> and um, it was considered, I, I believe it was called the BIE Native American Language Immersion Grant. And the title of our project was Building the Foundational Elements of a BIE Native Language Immersion Initiative to develop oral proficiency. So those were the keywords that were in that long title. And um, we were so excited because we were seeing that BIE is really addressing language in a way that really makes a lot of sense to us because our mission has always been guided by the vision to create speakers. Unless we create speakers and continue to um, develop the oral skills so that we can use the language every day, um, the language is going to suffer. That's just a given. And we really, really wanted to emphasize from the beginning that the goal should be to um, create speakers. So the vision is to create speakers and that's the big goal. So please remember those words, the big goal. And we were assigned 33 of the 48 uh, BIE schools in the Western region. Um, it was divided in two because of the number, but also because uh, there was another group doing New Mexico, I believe. So these are the 40, uh, 33. The Bureau operated schools are in the very left of your screen. And then the next two screens are the tribally controlled schools. Next slide, next slide. Our project objectives were uh, first to survey the current situations in the 33 BIE schools vis-a-vis -vis native language. NL, by the way, will mean native language or languages from here on. Um, and then we were to conduct a training workshop which is open to the 33 BIE schools that we worked with. Thank you. <laughs> and then we were to, we were going to visit six 
of the schools to get more information and provide training or consultation or whatever they felt they wanted most. And the information that were gathered would be included in ILI's native language resource directory. And finally, the recommendations of a framework for BIE to advance the native language immersion initiative. Next slide. So the recommendations to build the frameworks for BIE native language classes to produce speakers of native languages. What we know and found to be um, confirming through this project was we have to depart from the um, never ending cycle, which has not produced speakers in the over, I'm gonna say over 30 years of of the language movement. So um, there has to be changes, the changes to the approaches in how we instruct and the attitudes that are uh, embedded in how we think about language, what it means, and changes that have to affect all the stakeholders, not just teachers and students, but all stakeholders. And then these changes have to be prioritized in the order of urgency. The list is pretty long. It was, uh, it's not just BIE, but just we just know from our uh, being around for so long and talking to people that we are all uh, dealing with necessity to change how we do this. And then we have to think about changes that are attainable, nothing so far away that we feel discouraged or fail. Next slide, please. So we, we looked at the BIE mission statement and I'm not gonna read it, but what we found is just, it covers a lot of things and very pertinent things, but we found that it lacked the word language. And our recommendation um, to the Bureau is to possibly change or revise the mission statement to add the language about the Bureau's commitment to offer native language learning opportunities. It just makes it more strong in terms of advocating. And I don't know how long it takes for things like that to change, but um, uh, it just is one of these um, subtle but important necessary things that we need to see and hear. Next slide. And we wanted to bring to our attention, once again, Public Law 101-477 the Native American Languages Act, or NALA, that was passed as a public law in 1990. You know, this is 30 years ago. And what we found is a lot of people know about it, but they really haven't used it or implemented in the most effective and in the way that is um, comprehensive. You have so much power using this public law to advocate for language work. And um, more surprising, many people don't know about this law. And this is uh, not a surprise because you know we don't talk about this every day, but it's, it's an important piece. And there are many provisions in the law, but the number three and number five are the ones that I wanted to highlight for this presentation. And again, I won't read it, but it really it acknowledges the fact that the native languages as a medium of instruction, meaning you would use your native language to instruct classes, is really embedded in the language of this law. So it's already pointing towards something like the Hawaiian model where you are going to be using the language to teach everything. And this is to support all of the A, B, C, D, and E. And then also, again, it talks about recognize the right of tribes and native governing bodies to use Native American languages as a medium of instruction in all schools funded by the Secretary of the Interior. Now, um, it, once we digest and understand and really make this our one of our tools and weapons to fight for our rights, um, it's there as, as a backup of the law. Next slide, please. I wanted to mention NALA because I will refer to it on fairly regularly. Now to do, to reach that big goal of creating speakers, there are some fundamental requirements. Step one is remember the big goal. 
the big goal to produce speakers. When you have that as the beacon, the light that guides you, a lot of things will change. So the first step is to make that commitment to advocate, to produce speakers. We need a buy-in from all stakeholders. And in vis-a-vis -vis BIE, that would require the BIE staffing, um, the superintendents, the principals, uh, the school board members, pretty much everybody involved in the school to commit to this big goal. And then to implement concrete measures. And these can be you know, very, very, very practical, but the part that really, really resonates to me is what one of the elders in our neighboring Pueblo said, we have to bring joy back into our language. And so concrete measures that do step-by-step -step, um, tool building, but also to reignite the value, the vitality and the joy to our languages. Next play. Next slide. <clears throat> and step two are more specific requirements. And these are the things that I'd like to go over as far as what we found and what we recommended. In order to uh, produce speakers, these are things that we need. First of all, the instructors who are proficient in the native language. Proficient here does not mean fluent. Um, sad to say, we are losing so many first language fluent speakers as we speak. Many of the instructors are stepping up to that role of uh, instructing as second language learners. And you know, we've seen um, people who are in their 20s. This is so exciting, actually. But anyway, so those who are building their proficiency, they need in-depth and continuing training to build um, approaches that build communicative skills. There needs to be abundant language input. And what we mean by that is lots of exposure by the learners to natural spoken language. Other large languages have radio, television shows, movies, newspapers, name it. You can find a lot of tools to surround yourself to learn language. Sadly, our native languages are, are not quite there yet. So input we have to think about what would that input look like. And then the number of hours daily for language input and intense practice is a very important factor. And um, training for the leadership and administrators regarding what is language acquisition and how, what is the process of oral language development. Many of our leadership really does not have enough knowledge and understanding so they will be wondering after three years, how come we don't have speakers? But once they understand what goes into um, that whole process, um, I think it would change a lot of uh, dynamics that are happening. Uh, next slide, please. So let's look at uh, training language instructors and their assistants. Um, as I mentioned, many of them are second language learners, so it's very important for them to continue to learn, to build their own language skills. And then um, the fluent speakers who are now asked to come to the classrooms to teach language, they must be offered regular, ongoing, and in-depth training on effective instruction methods. This is a quote from a collective of us colleagues, people I work with, <laughs> we all agreed and we didn't want any of our names to attach to it, but it's a group of us who said it is an injustice for them, meaning the community members, to be expected to implement language classes without proper training and tools. And these trainings must be strategically designed so that they are understood by these community-based people as well as academically trained people and must be delivered in a way that allows them the ample time and ability to practice these new approaches. And ultimately it is about shifting mindset. A lot of teachers are not happy about this change. A lot of administrators are not happy about this change, but it will take time perhaps, but in the meantime, please note that time is running out. 
the buy-in, the continuous practice of new approaches and ongoing encouragement and feedback is one of the requirements. Next slide, please. And we wanna look at leadership, administrators, school staff. Um, again, I think there's just not enough knowledge and deep understanding of these three things I'm gonna go over. So a seminar for the leadership on the NALA of 1990, a seminar probably series on language acquisition and oral language development process. Um, you know, wh what is it that is required? How long does it take? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. All these things are information that would be very useful for developing strategies for our leaders. And the seminar on how leaders can effectively and joyfully incorporate languages into the school environment. I'll talk about this a little later in the later slide. Next slide, please. So I bring this to your attention also. Many of you have already seen this, but um, this is from uh, American Council on Teaching Foreign Languages, ACTFL. And the novice range is when students learn the language in a memorized fashion and they're able to regurgitate. And so the novice range is a range. They have very zero and then they reach that upper level of novice. Intermediate is when they have the enough ability to, to grab what they memorized and start putting, using it in different circumstances. But they're still limited in terms of what they can say and how they can express. But it is getting there to a point where they can start to construct um, certain thoughts and ideas. Now, I will stop there because if you look at nine to 10 means ninth grade, 10th grade, two years. Nine to 12 is four years. So four years of 90 minutes per week, which is a typical um, foreign language class allotment, you, in four years, you might and you will possibly get to the intermediate, lower intermediate range. The advanced range is where you can start talking. So all this to show that depending on what that program looks like, we have to have realistic expectations and assessments. Oh, I pushed the next button. Next slide, please. So realistic, realistic expectations. Three years or four years of native language instruction, which is usually done in English for 60 minutes a week, which is sort of an average, will not produce speakers. I think we can really specifically say that. And at this point, if I had an audience, real live audience, I'd say, how many of you studied Spanish or French or whatever foreign language? And how many of you speak it? And usually there's very, if, if there's one, that person is like a, one of those uh, what if polyglot geniuses. <laughs> so the realistic expectations as far as administrators or teachers is to know that that kind of a situation will not create speakers. It's a sad statement, but it's true. Reading and writing will not produce speakers, but they are good tools to build oral proficiency. And on that note, I wanna point out that um, if you look around in your own community even, um, you probably won't find books or newspapers or um, notices or not, not too many things that are written. So as schools and teachers emphasizing a lot of time on reading and writing probably are not connected to the real goal of first being able to speak it and think it so that we can start reading and writing. And we really wish for um, more of those tools, but at the moment, it is not abundant. Next slide, please. So we made two recommendations. I'm gonna check my time. Uh, there were schools with no language programs and schools with language. So these are the three things that are the same for both. Mandatory training, uh, mandatory training for all stakeholders, course of study on NALA, and true history of US policies to suppress language and culture. 
The third one is kind of important because many of the young people who have really just been inspired to go on this language learning journey on their own were really struck by the history of why our languages are so diminished. And they got angry. Something started to burn in their bellies to make something happen to change things. So their personal initiative was triggered in many times, many cases, by knowing and understanding the history. Next slide, please. So here are the recommendations. It's a kind of a long list, but I'll try to go through it quickly and we can discuss it later. These are for schools without native programs. So what if we had extracurricular activities that would that can incorporate native languages? We, I saw actually one school that no program, but they had drumming groups. The kids are really hungry to learn about who they are, where they come from, learn more about their culture. So they had sewing clubs, beating clubs, dance groups. And if we can have a, a, a mentor or somebody who can facilitate to incorporate language in these curricular, into extracurricular activities, that is one recommendation. What if we develop extra credit courses for those who would love to create projects that use the native language. Examples are radio shows, newscasting, drama skit, cartoons, illustrated books. If the kids wanna do it, let them do it and maybe they can get extra credit. And then uh, provide platforms for these students to showcase these language products, oh, projects. And um, one school, there were uh, many schools actually, they have tribal seals in the hallways. And one school in particular had many because they come from different tribes. It represents different tribes. What if we had the students create some of these artistic images and um, signages for rooms like restrooms, cafeterias, library, et cetera, that that is another project that they can get engaged in. Next slide, please. A uh, learner-driven language learning method, which is an ILI, um, how do I say, uh, method and workbook. It enables students to select who they want to learn language with, from, and do it at their own pace. So if you, if you don't have a language program, they can still connect with family and community and study their language. And um, offering extra credit um, for that effort even, would be an interesting incentive. Um, what we also like to see is an environment where the administrative staff and everybody that's in on the campus would learn phrases that are used daily. And I'm really impressed, or we are all very impressed when you um, call some school and they answer in a native language. Not difficult to do or greeting each other. And that sets a tone for the entire campus and it again adds value to the native language. And what if we said to the students, why don't you um, consider as a project doing a short message in your native language at a graduation ceremony? Um, and then if you have a library, create a collection of films, videos, and cartoons that are in the native language. It does not have to be just one language. There are several out there. And again, it just says a lot about you know, our languages are still here. We are trying to bring it back into everyday life. And here are some examples. Next page, please. Now we go to schools with native programs. Uh, I put this up there as a number one priority. Uh, a dedicated classrooms. So we found many situations where the language teachers um, go from room to room when it's time for them to teach this group or that group and they carry with them a little trolley on wheels with all their stuff and this is not the most effective way when you create a space with your cultural objects the imagery the sounds everything that you can create as an immersive environment for learning the language and culture. That becomes important in so many ways. Um, we always talk about language and culture are not, are the same, it's inseparable, 
well, this is one way to make it happen in a very, very visual, tactile way. And then, um, and instructors have everything they need right at the fingertips. Elevating and respecting native language by dedicating a, a classroom or classrooms for native language classes. Say to the students that this is special, this is important, and we as a school are serious about it, and it places um, value, again, value on native language. Next slide, please. To be, this is continuing the with native language program schools. In the uh, language uh, classrooms, the instructors, we really urge them to maximize using the native language. It's not, we're not asking for total immersion. We're saying, if you use more, that means more language input for your students. You are giving them a huge gift. And um, so from day one, day one should be instructing your students how to say things in the native language, such as, you know, I don't understand, please slow down, may I be excused, um, what time is lunch? I mean, whatever your kids say, because that way they own that, they will start using the language and not switch back and forth from English to native. Uh, and the next bullet, that should be the bottom because it's the most important and probably the most uh, labor intensive in terms of having to shift how we instruct. We have to instruct it to build communicative skills in the students. They will get more excited about learning when they can use it and use it in practical ways. So being able to speak it would be a really big focus. And then again, cooperative learning environment where all of the staff and including bus drivers, if they can use the language as much as possible. And you can, that way the leadership is uh, leading by example, by again, putting value and seriousness into native language. And everything that was recommended for the schools without the native programs um, should be added on to this list. There's more, but I just had to keep it short. <laughs> Next slide, please. So from here on, I'm just going to go quickly through the other uh, projects that we did during this grant period. One was to find out what is happening in the schools. So this was a questionnaire done by SurveyMonkey. And you can find the actual uh, questions at that link. And we did multiple emails and faxes and phone calls, et cetera, um, to make sure this is filled out. What we found through this process was that communication, once, it, uh, let's say I call or I email, the communication um, is an issue. We really had a hard time getting to the person the information. And once it gets to the person the information, it not always gets to the people who need to see it. So some of the teachers that we would call and say, hey, did you hear about this? And they didn't, knew nothing about. So I don't know what's going on and it, may, it probably isn't all the schools, but we found this to be uh, one of the challenges and it might be something the um, Bureau might be interested in looking into. So next slide, please. So the results of the questionnaire, uh, we got five responses out of 33 schools. Now granted that only eight of the Bureau operated schools were obligated to fill this out, um, three responded out of the eight. So that's 37.5% return, which is good. The other two responses were from the um, tribally controlled schools um, that were, this was a voluntary participation. And the schools that responded, the range from, was pretty broad from no language to we have 50 minute classes four days a week. So the responses that were interest to ILI for this project was, how much English versus native language is used as a medium language of medium 
for instruction and the goals of your program. Uh, we had multiple choices that they could uh, tick off. So they are listed here. And the instruction approach, uh, is it to teach about the language? Is it um, teaching academic content in the language, et cetera, et cetera. And um, none of these were surprising, but it was in very interesting to find out um, directly from the schools. Next slide, please. Okay, and the other um, project activity was a regional training for the 33 BI schools. This happened in July 2019, before COVID. So I have to put up this picture because I miss seeing everybody in person. And, oh, I guess pretty much, um, I'm not remembering, but anyway, uh, we hope that one day soon that we can all come together. But anyway, it happened in Santa Fe at the Pueblo Puaque. Next slide, please. Day one was presenters uh, opening address from uh, Mr. Francis Fihil from BIE, uh, a presentation on the Native American Languages Act by Gerald Hill, Oneida, Wisconsin. Why is language important today by me? And uh, uh, Dr. Leah Graham from ACTFL came to present about uh, actually a workshop on performance and proficiency, um, how to measure. And then um, uh, Dr. Vincent Wirito about um, the, the Navajo uh, initiative on how to bring, bridge language across home, school, and community, a huge topic of interest. You can see all of the presentations on our YouTube channel, which is shown there. Next slide. And the next three days were um, conducted as training workshops by yours truly, Jenny DeGroote from um, Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff and Dr. Sheila Nicholas from U of Arizona in Tucson. We've been a trio for a long time <laughs> and uh, we were so excited to be able to provide the uh, immersion workshop to the participants. Next slide. Then we had the site visits to the six schools. And these six schools were selected. We, for, for the uh, following guidelines, once one was that if somebody asked us to come, we would be there. So a couple of them were like that, maybe three. The others we reached out and those who responded to our request for visit, we were able to go. Again, the communication was a bit of a challenge. So, um, Ultimately, we were able to get to these six schools. Now, the report on this is very extensive, but what we have made um, as recommendations for the framework are really, really based on findings from this site visit, the site visits, but also from years of knowing many of our BIE teachers from all over the country who have come to our workshops in the past. So it's not limited to the uh, two years of this project, but we have information from a long, long um, relationship. Next slide, please. And then all the information has been added to the ILI's Native Language Resource Directory. It was uh, first um, published in 1998 in spiral bound paper copy. <laughs> and since then, as you know, the language uh, movement has grown participation by many tribes have grown. So finally in 2018, we put it as an online directory. And uh, ANA was a participant in this project in supplying us with a um, lot of um, spreadsheets with lists of schools uh, who have received NA grants and not just schools, but uh, language programs. So that was a huge collaboration. And I believe Michelle was involved in getting us those lists. So thank you again. And then um, the rest of the people were um, the funders for this project. Next slide, please. And that is the end of my slideshow. And I wanted to end by saying, um, first and foremost, thank you to all of you teachers, administrators, and 
bureau staff and everybody who is working so hard and tirelessly in making our languages vibrant into the future. It's a long process, but you know, we are short on time. If we don't do something really rapidly to turn things around, um, we have more uh, languages that would go dormant. And then um, again, it is up to all of us and you wonderful teachers to keep this going. And the image of the water was to let's keep flowing like the water and go where it needs to go to nourish the land, our language, and our bodies. And I think I have a few minutes to, to open it up for Q&A. And Spike, I don't know how you would like to do that. Um, do you, let's see, do you have any chat messages that ask questions? Or do you want people to raise their hand on screen? Let's see, this is Spike. Uh, don't have anything on chat I'm seeing. Um, okay. Just someone saying thank you. Um, maybe just uh, if someone wanted to uh, um, make it have have a ha answer, ask a question rather because from our earlier um, work it seemed like everyone on the um, on uh, uh, that logged in just has to go off of mute. I wasn't able. To, I, oh, from my can... perspective, I don't think I was able to mute anybody. So does anyone okay. have any questions? If you do, just please unmute yourself and uh, identify yourself and ask your question. That's Rufina. From Guam. Yeah, everything you you mentioned in your presentation, I see myself inside the presentation as a longtime teacher and now an administrator. We only have 15, I mean 20 minutes for our primary and 30 minutes for intermediate and elementary to teach our language, and it's a mandate program. And and we don't have a classroom, so we carry our materials. So but this is what I did uh, when I entered that, that school. I said to myself, I need to speak my language. So I told everybody, even the administrator, the custodian, I don't know how to speak English. So that kind of like help, uh, help the kids be more proficient. But now I'm having a big challenge because I'm, I'm, I'm an administrator now and I have 150 uh, language teachers in the school. And then, you know, I don't have a lot of me to go out there and, and you know, and then I hear from parents that they're speaking English. My child said they're, they're doing more hard copies. And even with the virtual uh, mode of learning now, uh, you know, I do parent, um, um, parent uh, class on Tuesdays, every Tuesday, uh, only to, to, um, to continue our immersion program we just started thank you jesus we started our immersion program mm -hmm. uh, two years ago so it's still in a pilot mode um we start from the Horao academy which um are like two years old and then we that's the feeder to our kindergarten so this is the second year the the student in the first grade right now in our immersion program are so fluent so they're just now connecting all the content area to their fluency and I'm so grateful and, and you're right. Uh, we don't have too many of our elders that are more interested in teaching, especially with the mode of uh, teaching now. So we have a lot of youth, but I like to promote the youth out of the university and we need, we need to just, uh, you know, take care of them. They'll be the, the future uh, teachers of tomorrow. So I'm hoping because we have no uh, second language uh, fluent speakers. So we're building capacity with our teachers and we are just giving. So I'm looking for ways to, that's why I'm in this training right now, this summit, to get more information on how, what are some of the ways that my teachers right now, uh, of course, we, we have wealth of materials that we have produced and it's just coming from the teachers. They're just um, developing materials that aligns with the standards that they're teaching. So yeah, thank you for all the message today because I see myself in, in your presentation with, you know, some, and you're right, the stakeholders, everybody in the school community has to be, to play a part of that. And we, if we don't have everybody, we lose a lot of our, you know, a lot of the things that we really want to engage the kids with. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rufina. I have a question. 
Yes, Amy. Hello, sure. Scano, how are you? Um, my question is in regards to those proficient speakers. Many of our speakers come without a uh, credential that has a gold seal. How do you kind of verbalize that in a proposal where you're trying to utilize the current resources that you do have? Okay, um, when you say gold seal, I'm not sure what that is. Um, I was just referring to something more official, something from a, a state regent oh. department of ed that says uh, this person is capable and has been vetted. Um, how are some of the ways to work around that? Oh, yeah, there's tremendous uh, ways. One thing I can share with you is that uh, uh, depending on the state, there are 13, I believe, states that allow for community people who are not even, you know, uh, high school graduates, but who are fluent to get certified. And then they allow them to be in the classroom to teach. So I don't know which state you're from, but there are 13 of those states. Uh, it's an agreement between the state um, government and the tribes. The other is that if you look at NALA, it talks about a provision where those fluent speakers who don't have those gold seal um, credentials should be uh, allowed to be in the classroom. I don't have the exact um, you know, document in front of me to tell you which provision, but it's there. And, and if you have to start there, that is the, the uh, law that will give you the tool to fight for that right. Where, which state are you in, Amy? Uh, New York. New York State. Yeah, I don't think they're on that list, are they? I don't think so. I don't okay. think so, but you know, that's our, that's our current situation where we have people who can speak the language, very mm -hmm. few uh, and declining, um, but no one's, not very many can meet the standard that New York State is looking for to be acceptable teachers. Mm. Mm hmm. I might see if either Sheila or Jenny has an answer to that, because you've encountered a lot of these situations. Okay, much appreciated. Yeah. It takes um, the work of the tribal uh, leaders and the state government to meet and come to an agreement on how each of the tribal leaders or would identify speakers that can teach or those that are learning the language to teach. And so the tribal members or the leadership decides on who they will identify to be these teachers. But that work has to happen so that they won't get um, so-called certified to be able to teach whatever the language classes are and for space. Yeah, so that work has to happen between those two entities. So it is a process. Um, it's worth the fight because that's really what has to happen. As, as we build our second language speakers, we still need those first language speakers to coach. So they have every right to be in the classrooms. Um, I could offer a thought as well. A, Amy, that um, oftentimes, like um, Ine said in her earlier, um, one of her earlier slides, that it's really about um, attitude and, and mindset. Even within the tribal communities, uh, there's a lot of tension between accommodating the Western standards uh, because a lot of these programs are being done in the schools, which oftentimes is in, in direct conflict with the kinds of the proficiency of the speakers who are in the community. So there has to be some um, conversation, um, maybe not some, maybe a lot of conversation about uh, the vision of, of uh, the role of the language in the community and how that um, um, is supposed to be done within a school system that doesn't really have that as a priority. Um, so there's, you know, there's got to be some conversation around that um, in terms of the role of the language for the community 
and how the school will um, accommodate those goals and needs of the community. Because oftentimes, uh, like I said earlier, um, our communities then just kind of succumb to the standards-based kinds of models and end up um, creating barriers for just the kinds of speakers and resources that you're talking about. Thank you. And I think I saw Rufina raise her hand. Yeah, Amy, uh, if I may um, help uh, for Guam, it, we used to have the, the grandfather, we were grandfather, and I was one of that grandfathered in the 80s. And that's through legislation with uh, our, the senators and the University of Guam. So there's a four year program where if you're proficient in your language, you can teach the language, but they give you four years to eventually get your degree. I was one of that because my first degree is special education, but uh, when I started learning my language, then I went to that program. Now what, what's going on in Guam is we have the mandate and that's through legislation again with our speaker uh, from the legislature. So she um, did a policy where uh, if you're fluent in the language, you are able to speak, to, to, to teach in the classroom, but you, there's a track that you need to follow. And with the tracking, what I'm doing right now as an administrator is that I, I open an opportunity to the University of Guam so that they are uh, financially supported, uh, you know, so you can teach with, uh, as long as you take the 15, the requirement, which is get a class 101, 102 in history of Guam, and then you proficient, you pass the proficiency test. So I give the proficiency test. And then you have, you become a um, very basic educator, but you, you can keep renewing until, until you get to that status where eventually you, uh, you, you are fully certificated. So what's happening, we have a program out of University of Guam, let's go, um, Chamo studies, but that Chamo studies is not is not aligned with the school of education. So when when a teacher goes four years under Chamo studies, they're still lacking some of the components to be a full fledged teacher in in the in the school of education. So what I did was I I um, I asked for I did a proposal so that they can infuse some of the school of education component classes where it makes my teacher be eligible in all areas and a full-fledged degree. So right now we were pretty good. We, we have a good standard that, uh, but it's true legislation. And we just took a couple of senators to, to do a law that says, okay, we mandate that this language is important. It has to be in the school. So they can teach with proficiency, their, their speakers, but they have to pass the proficiency test in my office. And then even with the, just the high school uh, graduation, you can as long, but that's temporary. So you from temporary uh, position, you become uh, basic and then, you know, and teacher one, teacher two, something like that. So I hope that helps, uh, uh, Amy. Yes, very much so. I can take a lot of these ideas and think about how I could craft uh, my next proposal. If different areas of, uh, of North America have these things already there. And there are some states that are uh, behind the ball, maybe an activity of the uh, project could be to um, make it more applicable in my area. Because it sounds like you guys have things already underway and uh, we're a little bit behind here in New York State then. Also, it depends on the grant that you're writing to. Some grants would uh, be very open to you know, having community members teach. So any other questions or comments, thoughts? So this, this is Spike. Oh, there's so Scott. I look one more question from. Uh, I was wondering, uh, I'm from Conestoga Language and Culture Authority. We are located in the Conestoga uh, Indian homeland. We are still here. Uh, the Conestoga Massacre of 1763 did not kill us. It might come as a shock to everybody. We still have our culture. We still have our language. And uh, I've been recording a dictionary and grammar and uh, trying to work with others uh, in uh, the enrolled community. We are not enrolled uh, because of the massacre in what is now Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And 
I was wondering, is there any way that uh, BIE could work with our organization or is there any way that, uh, I know we're not after people's money to whose money we do not belong. And uh, I know there are different grants available to uh, nonprofits, but is there any way uh, we can work with BIE or ILI with uh, NALA in mind? Thank you. I can't speak, this is Spike Bighorn. I can't speak for uh, for the other agencies on the line. Um, I'll, obviously we have other federal agencies. Unfortunately, Scott, um, we only work, um, our organization only works with the bureau funded schools, the federally funded schools and the Bureau of Indian Education. Uh, we, we don't we, we don't have um, funding sources um, at this point to reach out to nonprofits or to provide assistance to nonprofits. Now, again, I stand to be, could stand to be corrected by my uh, a fellow feds on the call, but the, the, my charge in my small area of BIE is to work with uh, bureau funded schools, which could be you know, BIE operated as well as tribally controlled and tribally operated schools. Is there anyone on the call that may have, um, may have an option for Scott? Hi Spike, this is Mia Strickland with the Administration for Native Americans. And at ANA, we can fund tribal nonprofit organizations and state recognized tribes. So our funding is a little bit more, our eligibility requirements are a little bit more flexible. And we have two native language programs, the Native Languages Preservation and Maintenance Program, uh, as well as the Esther Martinez Immersion Program, EMI. EMI is more for language nest and survival schools that provide 500 hours of native language instruction Whereas PNM preservation and maintenance can be more flexible for app development, teacher training, um, whatever it is your community needs, curriculum development. Um, and both of those programs offer up to $300,000 a year. Um, PNM is up to three years, and ME um, uh, was reauthorized last year by Congress and can now offer up to five years of funding. So look for our website, ANA, um, and uh, we also provide free training and technical assistance. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Mia, for that information. That's very helpful. This is Spike again. I see we're at about 4.01, and I know we have other workshops that are going to be going on at 5. And so um, uh, I think we'll, we'll close it down. Um, Ine, do you have anything else you wanted to add? Oh, I, it's actually a question. Um, are these... Uh, can you send people the PowerPoints if they want? Is that for Larry to? Um, I can I can answer too. Um, oh. We're going to be po hi everybody. It's Michelle. Um, we're going to be posting all the presentations that we get on the uh, event website, the language uh, native language summit org, and there's a whole funding guide scott um on there there's a link to it already on the resources page and then for a lot of folks who are working on their resources themselves i'm putting a plug in for the pre-recorded sessions that Cree uh well shula did um we have about six hours on there um and four of them are really hands-on and walk you through like if you want to develop your own app if you're looking um, to share, uh, you know, do recordings uh, for your classrooms, um, lesson plans and all of that. It's really, really hands-on. And that's what Cree's gonna answer questions about those tomorrow. So if you have time to look at them before tomorrow, um, it's the last session of the day tomorrow where she'll answer questions. Um, so I encourage you to check those out. And then um, there's a funding guide that the National Endowment for the Arts put in um, across the federal government. It's called Arts, Arts and Culture, but it includes language. So look there too for funding. Thank, thank you, Michelle. That was very helpful. Thank you all for participating. I need thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your knowledge with us. With us. It's been very helpful. Uh, thank you all and uh, enjoy the rest of the uh, virtual conference and I know we'll probably be running into each other again the next three days. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Anae. Thank you. Bye. Have a good night. Thank you, Jeffrey. Yeah,